morning, and welcome to Lisbon Falls Baptist Church. My name is Matthew DeGroff, and I'm here with Pastor Rodrigo, and we are so excited that you've chosen to join us here this morning for worship. We're going to start off with three songs, the first of which is All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all, bring forth the royal Join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Amen. That's so cool. Our next song here today is going to be He is Our God. It says, you alone are holy, matchless in your glory. No one is like you. Let that be your prayer today.
And our last song today we're going to have is He Will Hold Me Fast. For my life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast. so thankful that you hold us in the palm of your hand and nothing can take us out of it we praise you and thank you for your faithfulness to us now lord as we go throughout our week please keep us faithful to you keep us in your word we love you in jesus name amen well good morning lisbon falls baptist church pastor john here with you Pastor Giuliani behind the camera. We're glad to be here today to bring God's word to you. A couple of announcements. You probably know them very well by now. But just a reminder, if you're watching us on YouTube, on Facebook, uh, there may be somewhere else even, share it. Like it. Let other folks know. Again, this isn't about us. This is about getting God's word out to people. And we want to be encouragement to people out there as we go through this pandemic here in America and all the way around the world. So if you help us in that way, that'd be great. Again, for those giving, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for those sending your tithes and offerings in through the mail. Keep doing that. Those of you giving on tithely, uh, we, we appreciate it, and we know that all the glory goes to God. I'd like to give you one more opportunity. When all of this hit us about six weeks ago, we were about as prepared as a lot of churches were, and that was not very prepared. And so Pastor Giuliani, uh, Mark Tidd, Matt DeGroft, and several other people in our church really worked hard behind the scenes to put together a lot of the things that you're able to see 
However, most of these things we did not own as a church because who would have thought a year ago we'd be in this spot. So we've had a few things donated, but we've kind of patchworked everything together with the technology we have. And so I just put a little bit of a challenge out. If God's blessed you and you have the means or you're interested in maybe helping us take it to the next level, we want to continue giving the word of God out to people, to as many people as possible, and in the best content that we can. Contact Pastor Giuliani or myself, and we can tell you how you can help us do that. And again, we just want to say thank you uh, for joining us today, and we pray that this is an encouragement to you. If you have your Bible, we are going to be in the Old Testament, the book of Joshua. And so you can turn to Joshua chapter 1, a pretty familiar passage. I'm guessing that most of us have heard at least one, maybe many more messages on the passage we're going to look at today. Interestingly enough, as we were going through the pandemic back in late March, I was reading this passage and the Lord just really started encouraging me and challenging me in my own walk because, hey, these are, these are fearful times. These are scary times. I don't know how many times my children have said to me, Dad, what did you do when you went through a pandemic? Don't know. This is the first time I've ever been through a pandemic. I'm learning just like you are. And their faces looking back at me like, wow, reminds most of us that I don't think there's hardly anybody, maybe a very few select people that were alive the last time the world went through something like this with the Spanish flu back in the 1916, 1917 range around World War II. So one of the things God been, God's been doing in my life is reminding me that he's on the throne. And I have to remind myself of that, and I'm guessing you do as well. So we're, just a reminder where we've been. We've been in the book of Luke. We spent about 18 months there, and now we're done. Uh, we finished last week on Easter Sunday, and uh, it, was a, it was a glorious time. We were reminded he has risen. He has risen indeed. And now we're back uh, starting a new series. We'll see how long this takes us in the book of Joshua. So I've entitled today's message, Be Strong and Courageous. You ever wonder why I would entitle it that way? Well, that's because exactly that's what the text says. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read through Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And then we're going to come and do a little bit of background. Because to understand where Joshua is at, we have to talk about Moses and we have to talk about the children of Israel. So we'll do a little bit of background. And then we'll see today how far we get. We may get all the way through. If we don't, we'll come back next week and do part two and maybe even further down the line. So let's have a word of prayer, and uh, then we're going to read Joshua chapter 1, and we'll kind of dive in. Let's pray together. Lord, again, we just thank you for this opportunity that we can spend time together in your word. Although we're distanced socially, Lord, we can be together spiritually, and we thank you for that. We pray you'd encourage us and challenge us. Lord, I pray specifically right now for people that are going to listen to this that are scared. Maybe they're battling COVID-19. Maybe they know someone else who is. Uh, Lord, maybe... Maybe they're just scared about what's going to happen because of their job or, or whatever the situation is. And we ask, just like Joshua, that you'd help them to be strong and courageous. Lord, no, not in their own strength, but in your strength and power. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' most precious and holy name. Amen. Joshua chapter 1, if you'd like to follow along in your copy of the text, this is what Joshua 1, verses 1 through 9 says. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Joseph, jo Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, to the land which I am giving them to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you to do. Do not turn to the right or the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What a great text, right? 
And what a great text, not only for then, but what a great text for us today as we think about what's going on around us. Whether we have family or friends that work in the medical field or people that are going through the coronavirus or, you know, uh, the political scheme, the spiritual atmosphere of our world. It's, it's some crazy times, maybe even the end times. But here's what we know. We know our God has not changed and none of this surprised him. And so just like Joshua, we need to be strong and courageous. So we're going to look at a couple of things today in the book of Joshua. I'll give them to you now, and then we're going to come back to them because we need to do a little background. It's hard to know where we're at in Joshua if we don't know where we've been. But here's a couple of things that we're going to learn just right up front, and we'll come back and walk through them today and and possibly down the road as well. First of all, Joshua is reminded that the presence of God is with him and with Israel. Boy, there's some application there for us, isn't there? Is God with us today? Absolutely. Now, make no mistake. We're not Israel. I'm not Israel, and you're not. These promises that God made physically, specifically, were for the nation of Israel. They're not for you and me, unless you happen to be Israeli by your blood. However, we can surely take some spiritual application, can't we? The presence of God, just like that was with Joshua and Israel, it's also with us. And the cool part today in the New Covenant is, this is it right here. The church is not this building. You and I are the church. Secondly, we're going to learn that the promise of God is sure and steady as the sunrise. God's promises will not change because God does not change. Wow, that's some comforting news, isn't it? And then we're going to be reminded that the paramount authority of God's written word. In other words, there's no higher authority than God's written word, the Bible. And Joshua's going to be reminded of that, and so are you and I. So we'll look at those in a little more detail when we come back and pick this section of Joshua apart. But a couple of things we need to be reminded of first. As we come to this particular section, one of the things that jumped across the pages at me as I read this was the reminder in verse 5. And and I think a lot of cases we focus on the be strong and courageous, and that's sort of the outcome. But the reason we can be strong and courageous is verse 5. Look at Joshua 1.5. He says to Joshua, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. God had been with Israel. And we're going to look at a couple examples of that in just a moment. And in the same way God was with Israel and with Moses, God would be with Joshua. And you know what? That same God is with you and me. And he actually lives in me and in you. Wow, what a comforting thing in crazy times like we live in. In fact, the verse doesn't end there. If you read the last part, God says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Kind of reminds you of what Jesus says, doesn't it? In the book of Hebrews, I will be with you to the very end, right? Or in the book of Matthew, when he tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? Jesus tells us he will never leave us nor forsake us. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. Wow, those are some great reminders. And I think not just for me, but for you as well. And reminders that we can tell people in our culture, our friends, our families, our children, that our God doesn't change. And he's with us no matter what. Now, if that's really what God is trying to communicate to Joshua, and I think it is, that his presence was with Joshua and with Moses and with Israel, then it might be helpful to understand how God's presence was with them. And I'd like to give you four examples. There are many, many more, but I think there are four that specifically speak to what Joshua is dealing with here. First, the cloud by day. Second, the pillar of fire by night. Third, the cloud over the tabernacle. And fourth, God gives the children of Israel manna and quail every day except for the Sabbath. Now, there are many, many other pictures God will give of his presence. But I think those four really relate here to the book of Joshua And they just remind us of how God was with his people, of how I will never leave you or forsake you because he never did. So let's look at a couple of those. Now, I'm not going to turn in my Bible here. I've got the passages written down, but if you'd like to, you can do that. Let me read you some passages. First, in Exodus 13, 22, the Bible says, God did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, from before the people. So he was with them all the time as they came out of Egypt, a reminder of his presence. 
Exodus 40, verse 38 says, For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and the fire was over it by night in the sight of the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So think about that, right? Not just when they came out, but for all 40 years. This is incredible. And that's why it's important in the book of Joshua, because now they've been in the wilderness for 40 years. They've just come in, but there's a couple of these that are going to be consistent and stay with them for a little while until they don't need God's presence by a cloud and a fire anymore, because eventually, a couple hundred years down the road, they're going to build an actual temple. And let me just stop there for a second. We have a temple today, but it's not a temple made with hands. This is God's temple. You are God's temple. And so just like God promised Joshua that he was going to be with him, Jesus said to us in Matthew 28, I will be with you until the end of the age. Jesus Christ lives in us. What a great application and what a great comfort in times like these. Well, not only that, if we look in the Bible, we'll also see in the book of Numbers, chapter 14. G, um, the Bible says, They will tell the inhabitants of the land they have heard that you are the Lord among these people, that you are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them. So not only was God's present with, presence with Israel, but his presence was proclaimed to the other nations because his presence was with Israel, and it was visible. And probably not just visible to them, but visible to the other people around them. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 33, the Bible says, Who went in the way before you to search out a place for you, to pitch your tents, to show you the way you should go, in the fire by night and the cloud by day. So we just looked at Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the books that right precede the book of Joshua. Now here's what's interesting. I had forgotten about this. This is also mentioned in the book of Nehemiah, which is way, way after the children of Israel have been taken away in captivity. This is probably around a thousand years after what we're reading right here. In Nehemiah 9.12, here's what Nehemiah says. Moreover, you led the children of Israel by day with a cloud, with a pillar by night, and a pillar of fire to give them light on the road which they should travel. So again, before in the middle of with Joshua and after, the children of Israel are reminded of the presence of God with his people. Oh, friends, don't you dare think God has forgotten you. His presence lives in you. He is with you until the very end of the age. What a wonderful application and a great reminder for us. Well, not only that, it's also mentioned in the book of Isaiah. We won't look at that now. If you'd like to look up the passage I just read, that's Nehemiah 9.12, and it's also mentioned again in Nehemiah 9.19. Now, those are the first three. We also have one other visible presence of God that was given. Like I said, there are several others contained in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, but I think these four relate specifically to the book of Joshua, and that is the manna and the quail. In Exodus 16.31, the Bible tells us, And the house of Israel called the name manna, saying, What is it? Manna literally means, what is it? Sounds kind of funny in the American language, doesn't it, in English? But, you know, when you think about it, they named it manna. It was white coriander seed, and the taste was like wafers made with honey. Now, what's interesting, if you continue to read, and I'm not going to read all of them right now, but you could go on to Exodus 16.33, Exodus 16.35, Numbers 11.6, which I'll read for you, it says, But now our whole being is dried up, and there's nothing except this manna before our eyes. So they get this manna, and they kind of start complaining, because they want something else. And so the Bible says that God eventually gives them quail. So they get manna in the mornings, they get quail at night. In Deuteronomy 8.3, which by the way, Deuteronomy means second law, or the second recounting of the law, it says this, So God humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds of the mouth of the Lord. Does that sound familiar? It should. Jesus will quote that particular passage when he's tempted by the devil, right? That God gives us bread, and it was a picture of his presence, but ultimately... What's better than bread is the true bread of life, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We just celebrated his resurrection last week, didn't we? Well, here's what else is really neat. When you come into the book of Joshua, they had the pillar of cloud during the day, the pillar of fire by night. They had the manna and the quail every day, and then they had the cloud over the tabernacle. What's interesting is, don't know a whole lot about the first three. 
The cloud over the tabernacle probably happened for a while, although Joshua doesn't talk a lot about it. We don't know about the fire by day and night, but we do know that the manna and the quail continued as a reminder of God's presence when they came into the land. And if you have a Bible, you can look at Joshua 5, 12, which says this, Then the manna ceased on the day after they'd eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. So finally, God takes it away and finishes it. But again, at this point, he's reminding Joshua, Listen, I've been with you, I was with Moses, and I'm not going to leave you, and I will not forsake you. What a great reminder, isn't it? And friends, what a great reminder for you and me. For those of you that know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he will never leave you and forsake you. Once you're in, once you know him as, your, as his son or his daughter, you can't ever get out. And you want to know why? Because Jesus himself says, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they follow me and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no one can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Friends, that is some real encouragement in some really crazy times. Now let's go back to the book of Joshua for a moment. There's a little background for you. We're going to learn a couple of, I guess I would call them truths. We could also probably call them principles, but they, you know, they, they just kind of jump off the page at you. They're not rocket science. They're right here. In fact, if you read the text, you could probably make an outline yourself. And so this is just kind of how I've outlined this text. And to kind of introduce it to us, I thought, I thought it was a, a good quote, and so I'm going to read it to you from a pastor named Greg Laurie. He says this, When unbelief tries to solve a problem, it always creates a bigger problem. Let me repeat that. When unbelief tries to solve a problem, it always creates a bigger problem. That's from Pastor Greg Laurie. And that's really what God is trying to remind Joshua of here. Because let's remember a couple of other things. Joshua's mentor, Moses, could not come in the land because he disobeyed God. As godly as Moses was, a man that spoke with God face to face, the Bible will call him the most humble and meek man that's ever walked the face of the earth obviously outside of God himself, is still not allowed to come in the land because at one point, the promised land, he didn't trust God. And so God is reminding Joshua, listen, you're in the land now. I gave you what I promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Do I ever miss? No, God doesn't. But we're humans and we sometimes have trust issues. We a lot of times walk by sight, not by faith. We're called to walk by faith, not by sight. And so I called this the plan for man, because of God, we can. It has a little rhyme, and it helps me understand the book of Joshua. I don't know if it'll help you or not. But the plan for man was because of God, they can, or we can. And so here's a couple of thoughts. First off, Joshua could be strong and courageous because God promised and God delivered. Joshua could be strong and courageous because God promised and God delivered. Now, before we look at the text, we could insert my name or yours there. John can be strong and courageous because God promises and God delivers. Now, I'm not suggesting I'm Joshua or you. We're not. And I'm not suggesting I'm Israel because I'm not. But the spiritual application is the same. And so let's look at what the text of Scripture says. Look at Joshua 1.6. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Joshua could be strong and courageous. Why? Not because he was strong and courageous, but because God was strong and courageous. Now, see, that's the reminder here. We can be strong and courageous in this time with the coronavirus, or maybe it's cancer, or maybe it's finances, or maybe it's a, a broken marriage. I don't know what it is, but we can be strong and courageous, not because we're amazing people and not because we're super strong. No, friends, but because of who we serve, because the God we serve and the God we know, because he is strong, because he is on the throne. And it's the same way for Joshua. In Joshua 10, 25, it says this, Then Joshua said, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for the Lord will do all to all your enemies and put them to flight. 
In other words, interesting, isn't it, that by Joshua chapter 10, Joshua is telling the children of Israel, listen, you guys need to be strong and courageous. Well, now wait, I thought God was telling him that in chapter 1. He was. And now Joshua got it, and he was living it. Pretty awesome, isn't it? Secondly, we're going to be reminded Joshua could be strong and courageous because of those who went before him. We already talked a little bit about it, and that's Moses. Look at Joshua 1, 7. Only, now God's going to repeat himself here, only be strong and very courageous. Interesting, God adds something here. In verse 6, he says, be strong and of good courage. Now he says, be strong and very courageous. Watch why, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. So what is God saying there? Well, God's reminding Joshua, listen, remember Moses? Remember how Moses obeyed my law? Now he messed up and wasn't allowed to come in the land at the very end. But for the most part, Moses did what God told him to do and passed the law on to Joshua. And God is reminding Joshua, you can be strong and courageous because I promise and I deliver. And also you can be strong and courageous because of those that went before you. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now Moses. And for us, now we're going to look at Joshua. In Joshua 1.18, the Bible says this, all of these rebels who do not obey your command and do not heed your words shall be put to death. Only be strong and be of good courage. And so that's a little bit later in, in chapter 1 where there's a bunch of people that listen. They don't want to follow God. They don't want to be in the right spot. And so Joshua has to make some hard decisions. He has to, he has to decide, okay, am I going to follow God or not? And so interesting, isn't it? God tells him right up front, listen, I want you to be strong and courageous because of who I am, because of what I've done and because of those that have come before you. Here's the third reason Joshua could be strong and courageous, and I think this is probably the most pivotal, and maybe the hardest one for us, and it's probably hard for Joshua. Look at what verse 8 says. There's kind of a second piece hidden within that. Here's what it says. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And so ultimately, Joshua is taken back to the same thing we've talked about many times, the foundation of the Word of God. Now, we have an advantage Joshua didn't. He probably had, and I say probably because it had just finished being written by Moses, all of the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, also known as the Law. He for sure had the Ten Commandments and maybe didn't even have all of those books, but most likely he probably did because Moses had been penning those and had just died. But that's all he had, and God told him to meditate on it. So Joshua was to meditate on the law of God, to focus and do God's word, because that's what God commanded. Wow, that's a great reminder for us, isn't it? In fact, we're reminded that same thing several times in the scriptures. Here are a couple. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, the very first psalm, which is written as a reflection of the book of Genesis, says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now for the children that are listening, this might gross a few of you out, but this is the reality. The idea of meditation in the book of Psalms and here in Joshua is simply of this. It's of a cow chewing their cud. You know how a cow chews their cud? They take their, their feed, they eat it, they chew it up in their mouth, and it goes out into their first stomach. And then, this is the gross part, they regurgitate it back up, and they chew it again until it goes down into their second stomach, and then up and into their third stomach, and then their fourth, and finally it's digested into the rest of their system, and we get really good things like milk that come out of that. That's the picture of what God is telling Joshua and what the Psalms tells us, meditating on the Word of God. How about the New Testament? Is this just an Old Testament concept? No. Listen to what the New Testament says in the book of James. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. One of my personal favorites from the King James Version, which says superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. See, Joshua 
you and me, we can deceive ourselves by listening to God's word. It's in one ear and out the other. That's where meditation comes in. Like that cow, we take God's word in and we regurgitate it up in our mind. We process it. We think about it until it comes out of every fabric in our being. And so Joshua was to meditate on the law of God, to focus and do what God had commanded him to do or not do. Friends, it's the same for us. And how about in these times and these days? You know, it's so easy to flip on Netflix or Fox News or CNN or watch the latest video or the latest karaoke video or whatever it might be. And those things aren't necessarily bad, but let's be honest. Are you spending as much time watching videos as you are in God's precious holy word? Are you spending time in God's word? Are you meditating on it day and night? That's what Joshua was called to do, and so are you and I. It's hard to be strong and courageous if we're not strong in God's word. One final thought from Joshua for this week. Joshua could be strong and courageous. You probably already guessed it because God was with him. You and I can be strong and courageous because he's with us too. Look down there at the end of verse Oh, let's see right here. Verse 9, actually, it reminds us again. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. For the second time in this text, he's reminded that God will be with him wherever he goes. If you go back to verse 5, he says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. So he's reminded multiple times. In Joshua 23, verse 9, Way at the end of the book, look, listen to what it says. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations, but as for you, no one's been able to stand against you. So wait a second. When Joshua was strong and courageous in the Lord, he was stronger than those other nations. That's exactly right. And so at the end of the day, when we have this coronavirus around us, when we have everything in our lives that seems to be crazy and it doesn't make sense and it's a mess or things aren't going the way we want, we can be reminded of these four principles. And here they are. First of all, like Joshua, you and I can be strong because God promises and he delivers. Secondly, we can be strong because of those that have went before us. In our case, we have people here in this church. Maybe you grew up here with Pastor McDonald or Pastor Steve, or now we have Pastor Giuliani and myself and Pastor Brian and Pastor Alden, or maybe it's a Sunday school teacher or a parent or a grandparent, but you're following in their steps. Kind of like Hebrews 11, right? By faith, they walked before you. And so we can be strong and courageous. Not only that, Joshua could be strong and courageous, and you and I, because he meditated on God's word, the law of God. We can do the same. And finally, Joshua could be strong and courageous because God was always with him. Isn't that what Jesus told us? Let me read you out of the end of the book of Matthew. You can turn there if you'd like, but in Matthew 28, the very last couple of verses in the book of Matthew, say this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, at our church, we call that being and making disciples of Jesus, right? And listen to what he says. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, that sounds almost like a direct quote out of Joshua. I think it is, because it's the same Jesus. He's the same God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. A little bit of application as we close today. And we'll come back in the next couple of weeks with some, we may be back in Joshua, we'll see what the Lord leads. But I, I did a little study on this idea of being strong and courageous and wanted to just encourage you in some application. We've had quite a bit of application as we've walked along this path. But here's a couple more. I, I thought to myself, does the New Testament talk at all about this idea of being strong and courageous? And guess what? It does, and oddly enough, quite a bit more than I even realized. So here are a few passages. There are many more, but a couple select ones on being strong and the idea of being courageous. And what I remind you is this isn't a buckle up by your bootstraps, John Wayne, strong and courageous. This is standing in the word of God, in his power, in his might, in his presence, and in his strength. As I introduced in the beginning, these three overarching principles that I think Joshua teaches us. The presence of God was with Joshua in Israel and is also with you and me. The promise of God is sure and steady as the sunrise. And the paramount authority of God's written word that never changes. So, what about the New Testament? 
Well, in 1 Corinthians 1.25, the Apostle Paul tells us, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. There's some encouragement there, isn't there? In fact, Paul will tell us there that the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. In other words, the weakness of God is stronger than the strength of men. So how are we strong and courageous? By resting in God's strength, not our own. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, at the very end, Paul will tell the, the church, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Sounds very similar to Joshua, doesn't it? Be strong and courageous. In 2 Corinthians 13, 9, Paul will say, we're glad that when we are weak, you are strong. In other words, you might be stronger right now in your faith than me. And so you can pull me along or vice versa. That's the beauty of God's church. How about Ephesians 6.10, which says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Or 2 Timothy 2.1, which says, Be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. How can you be strong in something you didn't earn? Grace is unearned favor. Well, that's the beauty of it, right? It's not your strength and mine. It's his strength. In Hebrews 6.18, we're told that by two immutable things, it is impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation, a strong hope. We have that hope in Christ. In Hebrews 11.34, the Hall of Faith passage, it says that many of them quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong. You know, that's probably speaking of men like Joshua, or women like Ruth or Esther. And then finally, a couple f final ones. You are strong because the word of God abides in you. That reminds us of what God told Joshua, right? In 1 John 2, 14, John says, I've written you fathers because you've known him who's from the beginning. I've written you young men because you are strong and the word of God abide it, abides in you. Does God's word abide in you? I pray it does. Stay in God's word and we will be strong and courageous like Joshua. Finally, at the very end, I think of that song they used to sing us at Word of Life. I've read the back of the book and we win, right? Well, Revelation 18.8, as things start to come to a close, it says this, Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. You know, friends, many have asked, could this be the end times? Sure, could be. It might not be. But I'll tell you this. The next event on God's calendar is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come back and rapture his church. And that could be today. Are you ready? And so if you listen to this video here today, there's a lot of different applications. But I want to give you two simple ones. First off, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day. Get on your knees, confess your sins, and trust in Christ in whom alone there is salvation. The Bible in the book of Acts says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. No church can save you. No man can save you. No woman can save you. No amount of money. No amount of being baptized or good works can save you. Only Christ. And secondly, friends, we talked about a lot of application here. Are you in God's word? Are you resting in his power and his presence? May he get the glory in each of our lives. The presence of God was with Joshua, and it is with you and me in the power of the Holy Spirit and in his presence. The promise of God is sure and steady as that sunrise, and the paramount authority of the written word of God by where we meditate day and night. What, what's some great encouragement for us, us this week? Now, as we pray and part our separate ways, I want to encourage you to not look just to your own interests, as the Bible tells us, but look to the interests of others, as Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2. So if you feel like, hey, you know what, John? I do feel good. I feel strong. I feel courageous. Amen. Then you know what? Step outside the box and give a phone call to someone who doesn't. There are a lot of people in our church, in our community, they're not feeling very strong and courageous. They're lonely. They need somebody to come alongside them. And friend, that's you or me. And so if you feel like, hey, I'm doing good, then good. Amen. Then you step outside the box and you help those others along. Because you know what? The nation of Israel needed Joshua. And as a church, we need each other. We need you. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this opportunity today.
thank you that we could spend time in your word. As we go our separate ways, if there is anyone that doesn't know Christ, we pray today is the day of salvation. For the Christian, that they might be encouraged to spend time in your word, to be reminded of your presence in their life, your promises. Lord, the amazing things that you've done. And Lord, we know that you knew this virus was coming. We don't understand all the reasons why, but we do trust you. And we ask that you bless us now as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen.